Good morning to our viewers here in the United States and good afternoon to our viewers in Europe. Thank you for joining us for today's discussion about NATO. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany. As many of you probably remember, in November of 2019, France's president, Emmanuel Macron, said NATO was suffering from, quote, brain death. This served as a catalyst for alliance leaders to ask NATO General Secretary Jens Stoltenberg to engage in a forward-looking assessment of the NATO alliance in an effort to keep the organization relevant and vibrant as it faces new challenges. To this end, in April 2020, Secretary General Stoltenberg appointed an independent reflection group co-chaired by Dr. Thomas de Mazier and Dr. A. Wes Mitchell. Over the course of nine months, the group met virtually and consulted with government representatives from around the world. The findings of the group were, were released last month in a report titled NATO 2030, United for a New Era. In some 60 pages, the report makes 138 very specific recommendations. You can find the full report on the NATO website. Joining us today to discuss the report are the two chairs of the Reflection Group, who I hasten to add are both alumni of ACG Young Leader programs. Dr. Thomas de Mazier participated in the German-American Young Leaders Conference in 1989. He's been a member of the German Bundestag since 2009, and in addition has served in various roles at both the state and federal levels, including federal minister and head of the federal chancellery of Germany, federal minister of home affairs and federal minister of defense, as well as Staatsminister for justice in the free state of Saxony and state minister, Staatsminister for internal affairs in Saxony. Thomas de Mazier, herzlich willkommen. Danke schön. From 2008 to 2010, Dr. Wes Mitchell participated in the ACG's Young Leaders Study Group on the Future of Europe. He served most recently as Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs from 2017 to 2019. And in this role, he was responsible for diplomatic relations with the 50 countries of Europe and Eurasia, as well as the institutions of NATO, the European Union, and the OSCE. Prior to joining the State Department, he co-founded and served as President and CEO of the Center for European Policy Analysis, where he currently serves as Vice Chairman. It's good to see you, Wes. Thanks for joining us. Our guests will present the findings of the Reflection Group, and then we will have ample time for an exchange. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat function in Zoom or send me an email. Thomas, Wes, can you share with us some of the key takeaways from the report? And can you also talk a little bit about the process the Reflection Group undertook to produce the report? Yes, of course. Uh, dear Mr. President, uh, dear Stephen, uh, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to present our report together with my friend Wes. Uh, but uh, before I start with this, uh, let me say how respectful I am for the work of American Council on Germany. It did play, it plays, and it will hopefully play an important role on our relations. And in this crucial point with the new administration, uh, and a lot of discussion in Europe, I think it's even more important. Uh, and uh, if I look to you, uh, the, uh, well, the change of generation of the Cold War generation, very important one in Europe uh, and in America. They are now retired and, and old and, and now we need uh, the new generation uh, to um, have such a strong uh, relations like we've had. And in this, um, in this area, the American Council on Germany plays a crucial role and um, good luck for your future work. This I wanted to say because I was so thankful about what you've done uh, so far. Uh, your, all your predecessors and your colleagues and um, uh, all your uh, assistants and, and all, all the members of the family. Well, well uh, yeah. Uh, well, we del we delivered the the report first of December. We uh, 
delivered it, uh, presented it to the foreign ministers after eight months of uh, VTCs. Um, the group was uh, very cleverly, very smart, uh, selected by Jens Stoltenberg. In our group, we've had the whole variety of tendencies, mentalities, uh, socialization of, uh, of NATO, from Poland to France, from Turkey to Italy, from Denmark to Canada, uh, Germany, uh, Great Britain. So uh, this was uh, elder ones, young ones, men, women, 50% women. That was really a great uh, group. And then uh, Jens Stoltenberg uh, decided this, uh, by the way, with the support of the two governments that Wes and me became the co-chairs of this group. And this was really one of the, one of the secrets of the success. We didn't know each other before. Uh, we met via VTC, via Zoom and, and uh, Teams and I don't know, Kudu. Uh, and um, uh, we really became friends and I don't use this word very often. And uh, his knowledge and my experience, his youth and my, uh, well, uh, I'm a bit older. Um, one, sometimes I was the bad guy, he was the good guy. And then the other way around, we discussed it. Uh, we were very open. Um, his knowledge about NATO is extraordinary. Um, we, uh, I think we were a good team, the best possible team. In the end, we, we found a consensus paper that was not self-understanding. I must tell you that in the beginning we discussed how oh, in the last round what's going to happen if we can we make a majority report and do we allow minorities to have uh, minority opinions within the report and if there are a veto rate for some countries and things like that. Nothing happened like this. We discussed it so long and not bad as we say it, self-confident. Uh, and this is uh, because Wes and me uh, played such a good role as a really good team. Now, um, our mandate was a political one. Um, you've told me that not all the listeners are experts. That's good news because we discuss, uh, I can come to that in the end of my presentation. We discussed too, ma too much uh, among the family members. So um, we did not really concentrate on the military role of NATO. There's, there was a lot of uh, progress since 2014 under the leadership of Jens Stoltenberg and the military leaders. But we discussed the political role. This was our mandate and that's where we concentrated um, uh, on. Um, we, had a, um, we had a reflection phase, a consultation phase, and then we discussed ourselves the, the draft. We very much orientated ourselves on the report of Madeleine Albright 2010. Uh, we are in a tradition of the Wise Men Report 56, the Hamel Report 67, and the Albright Report 2010. Now it's uh, our report, and it should be the basis for the next summit. Jens Stoltenberg will uh, hopefully um, uh, take a, a lot of our recommendations in his own recommendation for the next uh, summit. Uh, well, what we, what we need for NATO, you uh, quoted uh, President Macron's um, uh, brain death um, wake up call. And you remember in the first uh, days of the Trump administration, uh, the president uh, talked about the NATO as obsolete. He changed his mind for good reasons, but um, there was criticism and, and the basis for this is not really, uh, is not really far away from the truth. So. It is a critical, critical point for, for NATO. So what NATO needs, and this is what we think is important, NATO needs more relevance, more trust, and more efficiency, and the ability to adaptation. Probably Wes will talk about the ability and necessity of adaptation in the change of world for, for NATO. We have a lot of recommendations, as you mentioned. Some said it's, there are too many. Uh, recommendations on the organization, on financing and communication, on climate change, pandemics, terrorism, the South, human security and women, peace and security. But uh, <clears throat> the main, uh, the real uh, important um, uh, recommendations are the following seven on Russia, uh, on China, um, on um, uh, 
EU technologies, resilience, NATO EU, and the consultation and decision making process and partnerships. So I would I would guess these are the most uh, important sectors for our for um, our recommendations. The starting point of everything should be uh, the next summit. We recommend that the uh, heads of states should uh, start and give the mandate for an updated strategic concept. The old one is is old fashioned. It's from it's not far away. Ten years ago, but uh, the, the, the times changed a lot. Uh, Russia is mentioned there as a strategic partner. Uh, China is not mentioned with a single world in this uh, strategic concept. Um, it didn't reflect uh, the importance of uh, terrorism and uh, especially cyber, IT, space, the new um, technology. So this should be part of the, uh, of the new strategic uh, concept. Uh, this uh, discussion should not take too long, one year or a bit more, should not be an excuse uh, to do nothing, to change not, nothing. Um, and, and this should be really a, a starting point for a more lively um, NATO. Uh, and so I would like to concentrate this time uh, not on, on China and Russia, probably uh, West can do it much better than me, but on the discussion process uh, about the political role of NATO, about the communication and decision making um, uh, this time. Um, we think uh, that this is crucial for NATO. NATO is not anymore, at least for some countries, the number one forum for security discussions among allies. Um, it's more the opposite. The more tensions you feel in uh, with Turkey and other countries, we di we, do we didn't mention some some country in uh, in this in this report, but you can you can read it, of course, between the lines, as we say in German. Um, the tendency is that the more tensions you have, the more uh, disagreements, the less you discuss it in NATO, and it should be just the opposite. Perhaps not like in the EU, where we are concentrating on disagreements in a way, uh, but. Uh, really to um, re-establish NATO as a discussion forum. Consultations uh, within the alliance must be uh, systematically strengthened. Uh, NATO must, uh, as I told you, become the central platform for, for exchanges on strategic security issues. This includes more and real informal formats on ministerial levels. The foreign ministers uh, meet only twice a year, the defense ministers three times a year. Um, one of, our, of the foreign ministers, I think from Netherlands or others said, I see my European colleagues uh, every four weeks and my NATO colleagues twice a year. Officially, of course, there are some, uh, uh, some, uh, some other rounds, but this is not enough if you look at what's going on in, in the world. Um, we need um, to strengthen the ability to make joint decisions more quickly. Um, we uh, have to avoid the increasing number of internal blockages. Um, the, the, the principle of consensus, NATO is a, a military and defense and security alliance based on consensus. That's absolutely crucial. We don't touch it. There were a lot of concerns that we should do and we've heard a lot of recommendation that we should um, recommend majority decision or something like that. We discussed it, of course, but we said no. Consensus is important, but consensus should not be an excuse to do nothing or to avoid decisions. So we need more informal meetings. We need uh, our one idea is that blockages should only be put by ministers on ministerial levels, not in the uh, not in, in, in the lot of committees. Um, then we, uh, in a way, we need something like we call it in European Verstärkte Zusammenarbeit, coalition of the willing, that those who want to do more can do that under the chapeau of NATO if uh, all the others agree without being a, a, per, a part of this. So a lot of um, recommendations in this field 
uh, to make really NATO again a political um, uh, instrument. Last word, perhaps, um, I don't be, won't be too long on communication. We discuss too much among us, among ourselves, with family members, with think tankers who are already convinced. There is very artificial discussion uh, uh, about experts, but we altogether neglected the discussions with the youth, with critical persons in the institutions, with parliaments, with universities, with um, the private sector who is not involved in, in, in the military language and security languages, and this uh, absolutely should be uh, changed. We recommend, for example, something like a NATO university sponsorships that NATO should invest in startups and things like that just to make a, a strategic uh, communication um, throughout the Western world. Uh, I think this makes democracies uh, more attractive um, in itself and NATO should be part of it. So this uh, is um, an important part of our recommendations as well. And if friends like American Council in Germany and others could be, in a way, um, interpreters, translators, transmission instruments for these discussions into the whole society, far away from the um, very much welcome family members. And if our report could play a role here, this, then I think it would be a good, um, it will be a good outcome of, of this report. Thank you very much again, uh, giving us this opportunity. And uh, if you don't mind, I give the floor directly to my friend Wes. Thank you for that, Thomas. Uh, let me just start by saying, Steve, how much I appreciate the opportunity to um, have this session with American Council on Germany. Um, I know the great work that you're doing there and, and keeping the US-German relationship on the radar screen in the United States. And I, as you said, I have a personal connection to ACG. I was a beneficiary of the great programs that you guys run uh, for developing young leaders. And um, I have to say it was a special treat when I was in government. I would occasionally on my trips run into fellow uh, ACG young leader alumni who are now in positions of leadership in their countries in Europe. And I think that's a real testament to how the work of ACG pays off and the impact that y'all are having. So thank you for the investment that ACG made in a younger version of me. Um, Thomas, it's great to see you as always. Um, as Thomas mentioned, he and I formed, I think more than a rapport, a real friendship in the course of, of co-leading this group of experts. And um, I've said it before, but I, I just let me, let me say it again. I, just having someone of Thomas's stature and grit as a co-chair was a, a great experience for me personally. Um, I think more than that though, it, there was a symbolic and practical value for the rest of the members of our group and, and ultimately for the NAC to see U.S.-German relations, uh, a, a kind of spirit of solidarity and, and closeness embodied in mine and Thomas's rapport. So I think it's, we're a sign that U.S.-German relations are alive and well in, in what is otherwise a very turbulent era. Um, Thomas covered a pretty wide uh, waterfront, but Steve, um, let me pick up then on, on a little bit of what Thomas left for me. You, you asked about some key takeaways. And um, let, let me give you a few uh, in, in no particular order uh, of what I see as some of the more important takeaways, both with regard to, the let's say, the analytical substrate of the text or, or how the, the report views the world emerging between now and 2030. And then if you have the recommendations. Um, I, I think... Uh, probably just a, an umbrella observation uh, that comes across very strongly in, from the very opening of the report to the end, it kind of permeates the entire report, is this recognition that NATO is moving into an, an era over the next decade and, and decade plus, uh, a competitive strategic landscape that, that in the United States, we often call it great power competition in Europe, tends to be called systemic rivalry, but it's, a, it's a, um, a moment in world affairs where we're seeing a change in the uh, global distribution of power, uh, clearly the persistence of Russia, but also the rise of China as two very powerful military actors, but actors that are also a, 
the, the largest authoritarian regimes in, in the world. So I think first and foremost, this recognition in the report that this is the one really big change in NATO's strategic environment and that NATO will have to intelligently adapt to those circumstances. And, and I think what I have to emphasize here is that the world we're, we're moving into and that NATO will navigate more and more over the next decade is very different from the somewhat permissive structural circumstances that NATO found itself in after the Cold War, where uh, it was almost greenhouse conditions that we became accustomed to of not having uh, a peer competitor uh, for the first time in, in, in NATO's history with the collapse of the Soviet Union and, and really before the rise of China. And I think that permissiveness, both in NATO and in, and in the policies of NATO member states, really encouraged um, a, a way of operating that emphasized um, uh, crisis management. You know, the problems that we were dealing with were mainly on the periphery. If you think, Steve, about what the ACG Young Group Leaders Group were debating a decade ago, it would be, you know, Afghanistan or terrorism or, and I think the, the really key thing to understand about our report, I mean, what will probably be remembered most for is a wake up call that says, yeah, a lot of those challenges are still there. We still have to deal with terrorism. There are new challenges, climate change, pandemics, et cetera. But the really big unavoidable features of our environment, of the strategic environment that NATO absolutely has to evolve to or adapt to, to handle are those changes in the structure and composition of, of, of the international system and specifically Russia and China as large, purposeful, well-resourced authoritarian actors who are growing more aggressive. Um, I would say the report then um, evaluates those systemic rivals on both a material basis. You know, these are military, cyber, and other challenges to, 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 to NATO, but also ideologically. As I mentioned, these are not democratic powers, and I think they advance a vision of the international system and, and, um, and of uh, the composition of states in the system that is, is um, deleterious to system stability and certainly to the world that, that we would like to see from a Western perspective. But um, what the report then does is having established this uh, analytical frame for looking at the world, it then moves systematically through NATO in its current form, NATO's structures, how it makes decisions, its strategies, the tools that it possesses. And it asks in essence, is NATO structured and equipped right now to deal with the world that's coming into view over the next decade? And, um, you know, uh, the report acknowledges NATO has done a really good job of adapting in certain ways. And, and Russia, the Russia challenge first and foremost, since the Russians went into Ukraine. But that, that, is an, that has to be an ongoing strategic adapta adaptation. And I think in some areas, NATO is behind. And we, we communicated those uh, areas of challenge for NATO or, or areas where NATO needs to reform itself and step up its game in a way that was... Uh, grounded in sort of a reasonable optimism, the recognition that NATO's entire history has been about evolving to challenges. So there's a, there's a grounded optimism, but also an urgency about the report. So then from that baseline, looking at a few of the, what I would see as some of the top line recommendations, I, th I think first and foremost, and, and Thomas alluded to this, NATO has to um, take on a, an uh, update to the strategic concept. Uh, when you consider that the strategic concept, so this is the blueprint by which NATO interacts with uh, the outside world and thinks about its environment, when you consider that, that the current strategic concept was inked in 2010, so 10 years ago, uh, at a moment when, so this was before Russia had gone into Ukraine, certainly this was before we were talking about China as a, uh, a, a serious international security actor. I don't think China is mentioned once in, in the current strategic concept. Uh, terrorism uh, isn't really looked at in, in, in great detail in the, um, uh, it gets sort of a passing mention in the strategic concept. So first and foremost, if NATO is going to operate in a way that matches reality, it's gotta have a real world strategic concept. We were very balanced in how we looked at that task. We acknowledged, for example, there are elements of the current strategic concept that are still very serviceable, the three core tasks. Uh, but we outlined um, sort of a, a methodology and a timeline for how NATO should go about updating 
that strategic concept. That's that is uh, agenda item number one. Um, another key recommendation I would highlight, or sort of a basket of recommendations, has to do with China. China is a lot newer challenge or or threat in the Euro-Atlantic area than what we're accustomed to dealing with, either from Russia or from groups like Daesh or uh, ISIS. Our, our group says, look, NATO NATO doesn't have a role policing the South China Sea. That's a bridge too far. But it does have an appropriate and probably neglected role in um, parrying Chinese moves inside Europe that are going on now inside the Euro-Atlantic area that degrade the security of, of its members. And so we spell those out. I'm happy to go into greater detail. But we grasp head on the question of China. I think our report is a couple of steps ahead of where NATO is at right now politically and internally. But, but what I would underscore is we saw in our consultations with allies, there is a desire and a demand for NATO to evolve in the direction of, of taking on the China challenge. On Russia, I, I would just highlight, you know, I think what we, I've said before, our report is, is a council of practicality on Russia. We, we do argue for a fresh approach, but it is a reasonable and circumspect approach. It, it's basically the idea of NATO upping pressure on Russia in key areas where it's aggressive but also uh, increasing the, the bandwidth for diplomatic dialogue and engagement. So a kind of more for more approach. I would also highlight the report has a lot to say on emerging and disruptive technologies, uh, AI, quantum computing, all of the data derivative applications that are emerging. Our report says loud and clear, it is not a, um, an option for NATO to not understand and grapple with how these technologies will change the battle space, change its ability to secure uh, the, the freedoms and, and liberties of, uh, of, of its publics. Um, and then I, just one other, I sort of light motif that I think runs throughout the report that I, I can't emphasize enough. In all of these areas, and, and in many others we can talk about in the Q&A, I think there's, there's a, a golden thread that runs throughout the text which says there has to be a step change in how NATO thinks about its political role in the world and specifically how it, how it does strategy. Um, so this environment that we're moving out of really did not set a premium on or, or incentivize strategic thinking. Uh, it, it was, that's not to downplay the significance of what much of what NATO has done since the end of the Cold War, but this has been a very permissive environment that was mainly about crisis management and problems in the periphery. And so our report is saying there has to be a purposeful move away from that strategic culture um, a focus on what we describe as strategic consolidation. And I, and I think the report, in, in summary, it, it, it argues that strategic consolidation is the overarching task for our generation of Atlanticists. It's got to be about the West, both the political West, the NATO as well as the EU, the strategic West, consolidating itself and having more of a unified front diplomatically, technologically, militarily, in an era where we're dealing with, with two really big, purposeful, uh, big power rivals, as well as many other vestigial threats and risks. So I'll, I'll stop there, but let me say again how thrilled I am to be able to take part in this discussion, Steve. Thanks for having us. Thank you both. This was a, a great way of sort of setting the table, and you've both put a lot out there. Uh, I will kick off the discussion, but let me also remind our viewers that if you have questions for our speakers, please use the chat function in Zoom or send me an email at sokol at acgusa.org and I will do my best to fold your questions into the discussion. So Wes, you were talking a little bit about the evolving strategic landscape, um, whether one calls it great power competition or systemic rivalry. And both of you talked about the, the updated strategic concept that's necessary and that is really sort of at the foundation of uh, the work that the group did and, and of the report. Um, I'd like to push you both on that a little bit. Uh, NATO's raison d'etre has always been to provide collective defense and security, as well as crisis management in Europe and on its periphery. And you've, you've touched on a little bit of this, but I'd like to know from you how the definition of security and security challenges is evolving. It's no longer just military. Um, you, you, Wes, I think touched on the fact that that China and terrorism are new uh, in this report. AI is included. But as we face a global pandemic, uh, 
what about public health and pandemics? What about climate? What about trade and economic competition, data protection? Um, and then sort of that's the substantive side of it. But can you talk a little bit more specifically about how the geographic footprint is changing for the organization? Yeah, Thomas, uh, with your consent, I'll take the first crack at that. I mean, look, the report, uh, the, the role that it talks about for NATO is deeply rooted in an understanding of NATO's reason for existence and it's kind of, um, it's, it's best and highest use. So we resisted consciously anything that on a geographic basis would, for example, pull, pull NATO into, I mentioned you know, policing the South China Sea, politically impractical to posit that role. Um, uh, but, beyond, but, but not just geographically, I think functionally, we try to strike a balance between on one hand, realistically identifying some of the very things that you've mentioned that are transboundary. Uh, you know, the, there, there are sections in the report on climate change, pandemics, women, peace and security, et cetera, et cetera. So we were cognizant of those. But the balance we struck was between, on one hand, yes, acknowledging those are, are, those are threats, challenges, risks, depending on what we're talking about. But on the other hand, uh, being clear about what NATO exists to do and what it exists to be. In some cases, NATO is the, uh, the first, should be the first recourse uh, for challenges that are uh, facing members of the alliance. And, and a lot of those at the upper end of the spectrum are obvious to us. And, and by the way, I, ju I, have to, I just have to say this, even as we talk about the new challenges, we can't get away from the fact that at the end of the day, what NATO exists to do is to deter attacks on its members and if necessary, fight and win wars to protect it, protect them. And no matter what else it grapples with, its, so its ability to deal with secondary or tertiary concerns is derivative of how well it's meeting that first concern. So we always kept that in sight. But then having said that, I, I think what, what I would venture to say, uh, and Thomas can say if he sees it otherwise, but on all of these other areas that you've mentioned, the, the litmus test that we used was to identify what is the intersection between the challenge in question and the security of allies? So climate change, for example, um, we zeroed in on um, where uh, carbon, the, where the effects of carbon emissions impact the security of allies. And the more concretely you define that, the better off you are for positing a, uh, you know, outlining a role for NATO. So if, uh, if for example, climate change is uh, reducing the uh, size of the ice caps and that in the Arctic, and that's leading to greater Russian and Chinese and other uh, penetration in ways that affect uh, NATO interests. That is fair. That is in the middle of the fairway of what NATO needs to deal with. Uh, or if uh, climate change is bringing about changes in weather conditions that uh, NATO uh, electrical grids or or critical infrastructure infrastructure are not prepared for. That that's a legitimate um, potential role for NATO. So without exhaustively hitting all of the subjects that you've mentioned, I just say we, we tried to deal with them um, comprehensively, but in a way that always brought them back to the core question, what is it that NATO specifically exists to do? And what is it that it's better off um, delegate, or not delegating, allowing other organizations that better fit that role to address? And, and I think I'm biased, but I think we struck that balance well. Thank you, Wes. Yes, of course, I agree. Well, NATO is not the uh, strong United Nations. NATO is not a discussion club. NATO is not the first responder for uh, important challenges in the world. Uh, we still are and should be a security alliance. Um, and, uh, but if you, uh, as you mentioned it rightly, uh, Stephen, if you say that the wording of security is much more than tanks and planes, then of course security can touch and is related to other issues. So uh, Wes mentioned critical infrastructure. So what we, uh, what we, it's not written in the report, but what is a hidden word, it was a hidden wording in our group was uh, think global and act transatlantic. So uh, if you think global, 
then you have to think about the role of China. Um, then um, all of a sudden, uh, critical infrastructure run or influenced by China within Europe, for example, to be owner of ports or so, can be a security issue. Of course, it's a trade issue as well and things like that. So the analysis much, must be broader than the actions. Uh, and um, in a way, in the last years, um, uh, well, the analysis was not, was not uh, broad enough. It was concentrated on the, on, on the, on the more tightener, um, well, um, meaning of, of security. And this has to be changed. Uh, and um, this is uh, the same on, uh, I mentioned on China. Um, just to give an example, when we discussed this issue with the experts of NATO, said, well, we are discussing it. There is this committee, there we discuss this, and there's another committee where we discuss this, but there is not a strategic perspective on China. So we recommended a special body on China. Um, so there can be an overlapping discussion about all aspects of China's activities who are related uh, with security. This is the approach we uh, recommend. And then um, uh, if we say we act uh, transatlantic, especially in the perspective of Article 5, the washing of the Washington Treaty, uh, then we need partners. And the partners, uh, democratic partners in the Pacific area, like Australia, South Korea, Japan, um, and uh, perhaps Singapore and New Zealand, um, to analyze together what's going on with China, um, not to act as a common security alliance, uh, but uh, at least as strategic partners uh, to strengthen our democracies and to be independent on security decisions. This is uh, what we think is important and this should be more um, than uh, than a traditional security alliance, but not a, a responsible institution for everything. When you deal with everything, you are do not dealing with uh, something special. Thank you. I'd like to, to turn to China in, in just a second in a little bit more depth. Um, but Thomas, since you mentioned tanks and planes, um, one of our viewers uh, submitted a question which reads as follows. What are the report's recommendations on reducing response time in the case of military challenges on NATO's Eastern borders? Well, there, uh, there happened a, a lot in the last years uh, to uh, including big exercises to bring troops from point A to point B uh, and, and military presence in in the Baltic states, it happened a lot there. Um, and uh, looking with concerns what's going on uh, in the high north. But these issues were not the center of our, uh, of our mandate. The political uh, approach towards Russia, yes. Uh, and uh, fields where we need, uh, this is in, perhaps in, in, in new element, which I, did not explain under the wording of communication. In the Cold War and later on, uh, we discussed a lot about um, military threats. We discussed SS-20, Pershing, uh, and SDI. Uh, I think all the, the discussions were, all the public were experts. Now it's everything is secret there. And it's difficult to persuade people to persuade, 2% of the, of the GDP when you don't know why. So to open up the discussions, what's really going on in Russia, in China, uh, without being, uh, without describing them as, as devils or so, is important to persuade people. This is a political mandate to, di to discuss uh, even more uh, military, military threats, but we were not, our mandate was not to increase the military cooperation within NATO. Yeah, Steve, if I, if I can just add to that, uh, sure. building on what, what Thomas has said, um, just, just briefly on, um, on, crisis, on crises, that the report in the decision-making section 
uh, we looked exactly as Thomas said through a political lens at the the special risk and cost that would emerge from uh, NATO not responding to say a Russian fait accompli, um, and we didn't get deeply into the military uh, field. But what we said politically and on the decision making side, because that was firmly in the remit of, of our task, um, we said, look, fa failure to act in a crisis like that would uh, explode NATO's political credibility, right? Um, and so we we recommended a couple things. One is having a time limit of 24 hours for reaching a decision in a crisis se setting. So there are different ways that NATO could uh, implement that. And we debated those in the group. We're gonna, we're gonna leave it to NATO. Um, but I think those are now, the options are well known. Uh, then Secretary Mattis uh, distributed uh, a, a food for thought paper on this a few years ago within NATO that, that got a lot, of, a lot of good play. And it's, so there are a couple of different options for how you time limit to 24 hours. Uh, and, and, and the question then becomes what happens after that 24 hours? What, what does it, does it elevate to the, to a ministerial level, to a heads of state level, et cetera, et cetera. But secondly, we, we said, look, NATO has to make the amount of time needed to reach a decision, a core metric in its exercises. There needs to be a stopwatch function when we are play acting or, or doing dress rehearsals of crises. So again, we kept it in the political sphere, as Thomas said, but we thought that was an urgent issue. It's a great question. So I'd like to, to spend a little bit of time talking a little bit more about, about China. Both of you talked about the fact that including China in a NATO strategy is, is new. And obviously China plays a, a significant part in this report, given its technological ambitions, its military expansion, its trade policies. There's no way to think about China just as an Asian player, but rather as a, as a global player. And um, Thomas, you, you mentioned a, a consultative body to coordinate Western policy toward Beijing. I guess the question I have for you is, is how likely or realistic is that, particularly in light of one of our viewer questions, which I'd like to read to you. China's miracle is the access we gave them to our markets without concern about the geopolitical ramifications. European nations, including Germany, are totally enthralled by the possibility of sales in China. How do we curb this sales greed and reintroduce the need for NATO members and other Asian friends to protect ourselves from the China's not yet fully realized political demands on the world? So again, the overarching question is sort of how could this consultative body work to coordinate policy um, both in terms of government interests, but also private sector interests? Well, uh, great question again. It, of, my first um, answer is this is not a European problem as, uh, alone. America has the same problem. Of course, uh, China is a trade partner for the whole world. Um, by the way, China is financing uh, debts from America and other countries. So uh, to think that we have a world of totally independent, uh, this, is, this is, will not be the case anymore. The world is dependent on each other. That's clear. This is, by the way, this is a German and European perspective. This is the best reason for multilateralism and international order. But um, having said that, uh, you should not be naive. Uh, trade partners should not be naive to each other. Uh, and um, so uh, you have to be very careful when it really comes to your, to your core interest. And this uh, independent decision making, we didn't talk about democracy and resilience on that. Uh, you have to be um, clear about cyber attacks. Um, you should own uh, at least... Um, uh, well, dominate your own critical infrastructure. Um, you have to run your own ele electricity, um, the, your your telecom uh, systems, um, the communication uh, uh, among governments must be uh, must be so that nobody uh, can disturb them or destroy them. So there are some other issues where you uh, where you need. Uh, independency uh, and there I think from a security point of view you do it better together 
we know that in some of these fields, Europe and America are, uh, are competitors as well. And why not? This was to the best during the Cold War as well. Uh, we built planes, America built planes. There was a huge discussion on, on, um, on, these, on these planes between Airbus and, and Boeing. Uh, the last years, well, it didn't destroy uh, our relations. That's, that's normal. But interoperability between uh, Europe and America, not only on traditional security issues, is crucial to survive. Uh, and to define the sectors where we are dependent, where we should not be dependent. Um, this, uh, I think, is the main reason for, uh, for, a, for a committee or a special body where we discuss it. And um, some of the opponents of this uh, idea, they said, well, uh, but we don't agree on special aspects on China. In Europe, there's a discussion. In America, there's a discussion. Um, and our answer is, this is the reason why we need this body. Um, so we, we cannot allow that there, is a, that, there is, that there are mistrust, at least among Europeans, about our approach to China. And we are not talking about that in, within NATO. So um, at least to start a common analysis and then to start to have standardization about uh, some things. Um, uh, an, an, an alarm system uh, on cyber attacks for for things and things like that. This I think is really important uh, to uh, to survive as strong Western societies. Wes, do you want to add anything to that? I'm or happy to, I'm happy to add to that, or or, or if, whatever you prefer. Uh, if, if you have some insights that you'd like to share, I'm always interested yeah. in hearing that. Um, but yeah, I well, also so on, the, on the China issue, we, we get this question a lot, uh, you know, um, and, and I think the question proceeds from a premise that's familiar to all of us from the newspapers, and it is that the U.S. and Europe are on divergent strategic paths and economic paths when it comes to, 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 to China. I question the premise, um, and, and, and particularly given the experience that we had in the working group, I, I was expecting, I told Thomas from the outset, I was expecting divergences on China to, to be the dominant kind of stray voltage or, or discord in the group. It just wasn't. Um, there was uh, a, a very natural convergence within the group. And even when we, uh, when we did consultations, formal consultations with allied capitals, I can't think of a single allied capital where the problem of China wasn't the first or, or near the first, near the top of the list of concerns that they had for NATO's future. Um, if anything, I think the political climate inside NATO is um, far more ready for an evolution on China than um, the structures on China in NATO currently reflect. I think we're going to see a lot of movement in that direction, and the report anticipates that. I would also say, and, and I think this is important for all the questions we're going to get, we applied a filter in our deliberations as a group. Anything that was gonna make it into the report as a recommendation had to pass the litmus test of being politically and practically plausible, meaning this was not a think tank report. So when we looked at China, um, I, I, I think you know if the report had said, for example, NATO needs to lead exercises in the Indo-Pacific or NATO needs to formalize um, alliances with Indo-Pacific countries, that would have been unrealistic. But for the report to say the obvious starting point, which is we need a, a platform and a space to talk about China and to aerate Western policies on China, even if NATO itself is not always being operationalized as the tool, just the fact of having a platform set aside within the Western political and strategic community to talk about China is an overdue first step. So in, in many ways, I think our discussion on China is about where our discussion on Russia was in the early 50s. And I think we're going to see a lot more convergence um, in all the areas that the report lines out, a consultative body, um, a comprehensive strategy, political strategy on China for NATO. And then, as Thomas said, tools to push back on basically any Chinese activity in the Euro-Atlantic area, and there are many of them at present, any of them that touch upon interoperability, 
and readiness or or the general security of allies is fair game. Thank you. And, and as both of you have said, in many ways, this report um, can serve as a wake up call. And I think um, trying to find a transatlantic approach to China is one of the areas where hopefully people will, will perk up their ears and, and listen to what you've written. Um, I'd like to shift gears a little bit. Uh, from its inception, NATO has been an alliance of values. And one of our viewers writes, how should NATO address emerging and persistent challenges from nationalist, isolationist movements in the US and Europe? And I'd like to give you both an opportunity to talk a little bit about the proposed creation of a center of excellence for democratic resilience, as well as the, the plea for a renewed commitment of all members to the principles in the NATO founding treaty, which committed them to uphold the principles of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. I think that that ties in very, very nicely with this discussion. Wes, will you start this time? Certainly. So the first thing I would say, just um, atmospherically, is that recognition of the importance of democracy permeates this report. Uh, I did a, a search and it's like 50 or 60 times that, that democracy in one way or another is mentioned. So the report anchors itself in the fact that NATO is an alliance of democracies. But more than that, it says the ability to keep that public institutional, uh, the, health, the health of democracy strong is integral to NATO continuing to exist as it has. But, but then it, it says something new, and that is that uh, the, the demo democracy and rule of law internal to NATO is intertwined with the pressures of authoritarian uh, powers who are who are pressing in from the outside, the, 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 the attempts to undermine democracy from within. Um, what, what the report also recognizes, and bear in mind this was a consensus document, is that NATO historically has not positioned itself in the last 70 years to be a kind of adjudicator or critic of domestic affairs or institutions of its members. And, and so that, that meant we had to strike a balance here that um, NATO has a precedent, and, and that precedent was deliberate and consciously reiterated at intervals in the alliance's history. And so, um, and I think you can see this, this time again, I mean, remember that, you know, NATO, a founding member of NATO was a Portugal that was led by the Salazar government, which was a dictatorship. NATO, you know, survived the coups and turbulence of NATO, of, of, Tur of Turkey in the 60s and 70s, and of course, the era of the colonels in Greece. Um, and in, in all of those cases, what NATO did is it played the long game and sought to provide security, to build up relationships, and to create a political environment where democracy could thrive, and as indeed it eventually did in all the cases I just mentioned. If we fast forward to the present day and we say, as a lot of people say, and as I think the report uh, says this clearly, that we're at a moment in history where, where democracy is at risk, um, and indeed, the, let's say for the sake of argument that there are critics of NATO who would like it to rethink the old approach, the old precedent of sort of uh, stopping at the water's edge on domestic affairs, fine. But the burden then is on those who would deviate from that uh, past precedent, first and foremost, in terms of political plausibility. So you have to show how taking a more intrusive or conditional approach gains acceptance in all 30 allies. But secondly, and, and this is what I would stress most, do no harm. You have to show how taking a more intrusive or conditional approach or a punitive approach on democracy issues, how does that not weaken deterrence and create openings for Russia and China? And I, and I think that's really crucial. So for example, our, our group heard the idea and it's gaining some currency right now that NATO should, for example, make Article 5 conditional upon the strength of democracy and its allies. Um, interesting idea. When you apply the two filters I've said, political plausibility and do no harm, it's dead on arrival. And so what we did is we, our, our recommendations on democracy and rule of law are anchored in that practical uh, kind, kind of foundation. And, and we said, look, NATO does need tools. We talk about the uh, Center for Democratic Resilience to strengthen its allies, the public institutions of its allies, when they are under pressure from external authoritarian states who are undermining democracy. But we 
uh, and we also talked about an annual uh, Secretary General report on the political health of the alliance, a code of good conduct, et cetera, et cetera. But we stopped short of a more punitive approach, and I think that that was with good reason. Well, uh, I, just a short addition. Um, I would like to differentiate. Number one is, uh, uh, would you say there is a danger for democracies within NATO from outside? My answer is yes. There are tendencies of uh, destabilization from outside via cyber, uh, via fake news uh, from Russia, from China, from I don't know from where. There is a danger, that's true. And we have to avoid that as NATO. This is a matter of security and the Washington Treaty as well. And the center of uh, democratic resilience can help there. Abs to, to analyze where does it happen? Can the countries help? Can we countries help? Things like that. Second question is different. Is there a danger for NATO from, uh, for, and our, for democratic values from inside? because of populism, because of Erdogan, because I don't know, from Le Pen or so. Um, I think not a danger, perhaps concerns. Um, uh, but uh, as mentioned said, we survived a lot. Um, and what I think what is needed is more self-confidence. It's very interesting yesterday uh, when Russia captured Navalny the comment of uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov was this is a question of uh, systemic discussion about your system and our system. Interesting enough. Um, and when we have problems uh, among us, we say, oh, it's a real problem, it's a danger for us. And also, this is not attractive for others. So, of course, we have uh, populism in our countries. That's true. But is, this is not really a danger for, for one single democracy. Uh, I don't like what Orban is doing with the Supreme Court and what the Polish government is doing, but this is not a danger for NATO. They are free elected uh, prime ministers um, and there is opposition there uh, and things like that. And, and uh, you, you is dealing with that, by the way, with sanctions and very difficult, probably not successful. So. We should not overstress NATO as the teacher for everything and everybody and be more self-confident um, uh, about what's going on uh, and, and how strong we are in, in the world. And this is, I think, the tone is very well put there in the, um, in, um, in the report. The value of freedom uh, and free communication in the, is the best argument for security in the world. Uh, and we should not undermine our strength. Thomas, since you mentioned Erdogan, um, one of our viewers is curious whether your recommendations included anything specifically on Turkey. Well, we didn't mention a country. Uh, we, of course, we mentioned uh, America and we mentioned Europe. But we, uh, and this was a promise we uh, gave ourselves, we, we did not want to make countries blame, blame gaming or so. Um, not, not only because our Turkish member was really a very good and, and, and experienced uh, person and it was very important for, for our report. By the way, even for the uh, reception in, in the actual Turkish government. Um, and if you see now the new signals from Erdogan to, towards Europe and perhaps to, towards NATO, our view was NATO 2030 and not actual troubles. Um, but of course, um, when we um, discuss blockages, when we discussed internal tensions, of course, we had examples in mind. We didn't write it in the paper and in the report. Um, but um, for example, if there is a problem between Turkey and Greece, we asked in the consultation, uh, what is the role of NATO? The answer was from some governments, nothing for NATO too difficult. It would decrease the cohesion of NATO. The opposite, uh, we heard the opposite advice from other governments. Well, if NATO is full of sense, then NATO must deal with tensions among, among countries. So there is not a 100% recipe, but 
at least it has to be um, it has to be managed by NATO. Um, and in, in one case, a phone call from Chancellor Merkel would be the good answer. In other cases, a phone call from from uh, from the American president. Uh, in other cases, uh, a Sondersitzung, a special meeting from from NATO countries. This is it is not our the report is not how to deal with Turkey, but that NATO should deal with internal conflicts more in a confidential manner with trust and with self-confidence. This helps. Thank you. One of the, the recommendations that you outlined at the outset and that both of you have talked a little bit about is greater NATO-EU collaboration. And I, I would like to ask both of you to, to talk a little bit more about what that might look like and how that can actually be operationalized. Yeah, that's a great question, Steve. Uh, you know, we, I think as a group, we're all a little surprised. I mean, given that, you know, everyone in the group is a veteran uh, expert or former policymaker of, 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 of European affairs. I think we were all a little taken back, uh, taken aback when we reviewed the state of the NATO-EU relationship. And what we found is that despite a lot of platitudes, the NATO-EU relationship is layer upon layer of formal agreements to cooperate more deeply, running back well over a decade, two decades, that have not been implemented. It is my personal view, and I'm saying this not for the group, but it just based on our deliberations, that, that, that will, it, this will continue to be an unsatisfying institutional relationship until NATO and the EU do the hard work of developing a new umbrella political agreement to replace Berlin Plus. Now, there are reasons that NATO cannot do that right now, and, and, and a lot of it has to do with the status of Cyprus, the Turkey issue vis-a-vis -vis the EU. But however hard it might be, my own personal view is that ultimately that's what's going to be needed. In the meantime, however, as I said a minute ago, we applied the filter of what is politically and practically plausible. And what we saw is that first and foremost, starting at the highest levels, there has to be uh, an honest review of all the existing agreements that aren't being implemented. And a signal from the top, and, and maybe the incoming administration and, and uh, some of the new governments in Europe will create an, op an opening for this, but there has to be a recognition at the top that there's a need for a jolt. Um, it may be in some cases that old mechanisms have to be reviewed. To just give you one example, the EU and NATO right now have 74 agreed areas of priority for the relationship. That's a lot. 74 is a lot of areas to say we're going to prioritize these. So uh, we recommended, for example, a review of those that would consolidate and streamline them, say, where have we actually made progress in the last five, 10 years on, on given areas, uh, and adjust accordingly. We talk about a, an institutional link uh, between the External Action Service and the NATO international staff. That's way overdue. It's really basic stuff. But again, we say all of this against the backdrop of sort of, of, of an awareness that you're not going to improve that relationship by tinkering at the margins mechanically. There has to be political will. It has to come from the top. There has to be follow through. And there also has to be clarity on roles. So we kept a positive, an optimistic and constructive uh, attitude on uh, NATO, uh, let's say on EU security and defense capabilities, for example. But what we said is, look, NATO should welcome Europe developing greater security capabilities, but only insofar as those do not decouple NATO. Uh, don't duplicate NATO capabilities. So we said in a more positive tone what Madeleine Albright said a decade ago with, with her uh, recognition of the kind of the three Ds. So a, a, a Europe that is talking about strategic autonomy, um, this, this, a move in this direction by Europe, whatever its underpinnings, has to be looked at with a lot of sobriety and we say in the report, in essence, if, what we're, if, our, if our diagnosis or, or our analysis of a more competitive geopolitical landscape is correct, at the end of the day, this should be a moment for the West to consolidate and unify strategically and politically rather than bifurcate or splinter into competing blocks. So I think that permeates the report um, and ex is exactly the, the right tone to well, Only a short addition. Uh, the analysis is that there is much more wording than acting together. Uh, so our recommendation is do what you say, and that's enough. Uh, 
and that's a lot. But don't um, talk. Uh, and in the in the deep uh, structure of the two organization, nothing happens or not enough. So this is uh, this is the message, and this needs a restart from from the very top level. Uh, and then uh, we have we've had a discussion about uh, strategic autonomy. It's only mentioned once in the report. Um, uh, some new wording in Europe is so, uh, strategic sovereignty. Uh, now I, I, I talk as a person and a German politician, not as a co-chair of the, of the reflection group. I think that the wording of strategic autonomy is wrong. We should avoid that. It's uh, an illusion for the next decades and it's dangerous for the transatlantic relations to, to make it very rude and clear and crystal clear. Uh, what is meant is okay uh, to do more and be more responsible. That's true, but the wording should not be strategic autonomy. Thank you. As we start to wrap up, I'd like to perhaps click through a couple of viewer questions um, that have come in. Uh, one viewer writes, NATO's 2% goal repeatedly causes discussion and disagreement, particularly between the United States and Germany. Recently, the German defense minister suggested that Germany would be better off providing, quote, 10% of the capabilities, end quote, of NATO. What do you both think of this proposal? Well, we, uh, we repeated in the report um, the goal of the 2%, uh, uh, well, the 2% commitment, it's, but it's only 2%. Uh, it's uh, uh, a lot a lot of uh, R&D and shouldn't neglect that. And what um, AKK, we call it, we call it in Germany AKK because the name is so complicated, Andergrid Kam Karmauer, is an important factor, not as an, uh, as an different, but an additional aspect. This is capabilities. Well, uh, if you pay 7%, for old stuff, then you uh, well you you are fine with your commitments, but it's not a real contribution to NATO. Uh, how do you count, for example, capabilities in new technologies? Are they more important or less important? Um, this is important that you can re that you can rely on other in field in the preparation on exercises. So. Um, Germany did a lot, uh, and the Europe Europe did a lot. Uh, the, the President Trump said this was my greatest success. That NATO now is on its way to the two percent. Well, perhaps uh, his wording is a bit overwhelming, but in a way, it's true. Because of his pressure, Europe did a lot, uh, and Biden will continue to do put such a pressure on NATO for good reasons. That's absolutely true, but. Quantity is not the only outcome uh, for NATO. It sh should be accompanied by uh, measuring uh, qualities and capabilities and responsibilities. Yeah, yeah Steve, I, I agree with, with Thomas. I, um, this, this question of capabilities and specifically 2% came up a lot in the deliberations. It's, it's in the news a lot and has kind of become a political football. As an American, what I always kept in mind it's just the reality. And again, we were looking at over the next 10 years, but even now, you know, the burden for the United States worldwide is onerous. Um, so we have a 30 trillion plus dollar debt. It's only getting bigger. We have strategic uh, commitments in places as distant as um, the Strait of Hormuz and um, South China Sea and uh, Sawaki Gap. And looking out over the next decade, the reality, and I, and I say this not only for, for Euro-Atlantic safety, but really, in a way, the, the greater stability of the international system in, in, in general is going to come down to how well NATO, and especially European NATO, can step up more and provide more capabilities in a world where the United States has to think long and hard about defending both the Euro-Atlantic and Indo-Pacific areas. That's a, that's a heavy burden. So on 2%, Specifically, we, um, I, I would just make two points. First, in light of what I've just said, I think 
there are political, reputational, and cohesion costs that come as a result of moving away from an agreed commitment or target in NATO. So uh, setting aside the merits of what uh, the German official in question has, has recommended from the perspective of our group, it really was not our place. And I think it would, would have set a negative precedent to argue against a, a standard or a commitment publicly made by all 30 allies. Um, and secondly, I think, as I've just articulated, the strategic environment that's, that's coming into view that our report um, uh, elaborates on, it, it is one where the, 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 the recognition that capabilities are part of po political cohesion. And, and by the way, that, that runs throughout the history of NATO. I mean, if you look at the Harmel report, the Harmel report, one of its big findings was you can't have political cohesion unless there's a relatively equitable sharing of military burdens. So, um, you know, I think Thomas and I both are positively inclined towards some creativity in this area going forward. Uh, he and I both liked, for example, he, he had the idea of a European level of ambition in NATO that didn't make it into the report. I'm very sympathetic to that. Uh, I think in time, NATO will move more in that direction. But for now, I think the imperative was to signal continuity and follow through on agreed commitments. Thank you. Um, and another question that actually gets a little granular is how can NATO meet the Russian nuclear challenge in Europe without its own intermediate range nuclear weapons? Well, I, I'm happy to take the first crack at that. Um, I mean, I, I suppose the, the, the first thing I, I would say is simply that um, NATO is meeting that challenge now uh, in the traditional way that it has provided the nuclear uh, leg of deterrence. And that's through primarily um, US capabilities that are in Europe, but obviously also the participation in joint missions and burden sharing and, 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 and basing and hosting these, these weapons by European allies. Um, but what I will say that I think gets to the spirit of the question is that the deterioration of the arms control, the, the Cold War arms control uh, frameworks and especially, and I think this is what the questioner is getting at, um, the escalatory um, uh, uh, declarations and potential that the Russians are developing to escalate in a conventional crisis. We were cognizant of those challenges. The, the report gives a lot of space and bandwidth to arms control, um, noting the deterioration of the Cold War framework, um, reinforcing the Harmel um, onward recognition of dual track uh, deterrence and, and, and de deterrence and, and defense or deterrence and dialogue. Um, but on arms control specifically, I think the report, it's important to see how the report calls for um, emphasize, emphasizing the, the positives of NATO playing a role to debate uh, arms control initiatives that the United States takes on with Russia. That's something we've gotten away from, but it's classic post Harmel kind of 1960s, 70s era role for NATO. Um, the report calls for more regular use to be made of NATO as, as kind of a platform uh, for um, aligning U.S. and allied positions on a lot of these things, maintaining political pressure on Russia to return to compliance, um, and, and, and in other areas as well. So I think um, in a post-INF setting, and this is the, the key, and, and the report stresses this, is the need for NATO to continue to evaluate and adapt the deterrence posture to take account of the new capabilities that Russia is fielding uh, in Kaliningrad and elsewhere. And so that I, I thought that the arms control section in the report was really strong and clear on that. I don't want to repeat what um, Wes said. Uh, just in addition, uh, there is no European nuclear deterrence. It just doesn't exist. I know that uh, Great Britain is, uh, is the owner of nuclear weapons in France. But France has this independent role. There is a NATO nuclear deterrence. And the most important factor is the American nuclear deterrence. And for good reasons, this should be the case in the future as well. Um, and, uh, Wes mentioned um, arms control. NATO did not, except of some, uh, some aspects, did not really negotiate arms control. It was America uh, who did it in consultation with NATO countries, and this should be the case in the future as well. But I'm not in favor of uh, building up a nuclear European deterrence. It would be dangerous for NATO, very dangerous.
So just two more um, viewer questions. One is, uh, can we expect new waves of enlargement? Is it likely that countries like Georgia and Ukraine will become NATO members in the foreseeable future? Well, um, I start this here. But with a, in the report, it was very clear. We um, we are uh, we are stick to the open door policy. That's clear. Uh, and we mentioned uh, Georgia and Ukraine in this in this uh, in this sector. True. But for a foreseeable future, I don't see it. Uh, uh, and perhaps uh, there will be a. There would be a lot of discussions within within NATO. It was in Bucharest summit, for example. Uh, I'm personally a bit reluctant, um, not because I don't respect the the, uh, the importance of Ukraine and Georgia, uh, and I'm full of respect of their way. But we should avoid by by well, expanding problems within NATO via a membership. And this could be the case there. It's not because of Russia um, and, and because I'm, I'm fearing Russia. Um, but when we talked about democracies, uh, concerns about democracies, uh, I'm not the teacher and the moral instance for the democracy standards in Ukraine and Georgia, but I have concerns there corruption and things like that. So uh, I'm, very, I'm very cautious. But of course, if we say we are an uh, open institution and we welcomed uh, Eastern European countries, then the door must be open. Yeah, Steve, uh, I would just add to what Thomas, I think he put it very eloquently. Our, our group weighed this important issue at length. There's a lot of complexity to it. Um, first and foremost, as was appropriate, the group reaffirmed open door. As, as I've said, I think the existing letter of things that NATO has agreed to do, as it, the, re the report, um, I think, appropriately reinforced that. Um, we also, though, validated kind of the path of these countries. We, we talk in the report about Ukraine and Georgia as a special category of partner. These are aspiring democracies that want a future with the political and strategic West. And, and more than that, I mean, the report... Um, it calls on NATO to be a forum where we can provide succor and support to states like that in that region and elsewhere. But I don't think it would be the place of this report to call for an acceleration of a process or a prospect of, uh, of membership um, on a couple of levels. One, if our analysis of the strategic environment is right, and we're talking about um, a multiplayer uh, geopolitical environment uh, where really the, the, the overarching goal is the consolidation of the Western world. That is not entirely consistent with the strategic um, uh, idea, the chief strategic idea of a decade or so ago, wh which was mainly integration and expansion as a substitute for strategy. Uh, what we're saying is NATO has to get its own house in order in order for it to pr play a stabilizing role anywhere else. And so um, that first and foremost, but secondly, just the political reality that there is nothing even approaching a political consensus on membership, uh, near-term acceleration of membership for Georgia and Ukraine in the NAC. And so we had to be cognizant that our report not become itself a vehicle of undermining cohesion. So to push for something that is a step or two ahead of where probably a majority of allies want to be would not be an appropriate or constructive role. However, and I think our report is clear and creative on this, what NATO can do and should do is get a hell of a lot more strategic in how it's using its existing partnerships. And specifically, and I think this, this impacts Georgia and Ukraine more than any other partners, it is just not acceptable that at this late date in history, and with all the pr strategic pressures in the world, NATO has partnerships that are not systematically um, and adequately funded. So a lot of people are surprised when they found out, our group was surprised when we found out, partnership act activities inside NATO, A, are funded by voluntary contributions from allies. A lot of allies don't contribute at all to them. Number two, uh, that, that we were surprised to find that 
uh, partnership activities um, are construed or, or, or um, brought into being as a result of requests from partners. All of what I've just described is the antithesis of a strategic approach to this very important tools. NATO has 26, yeah, 26 partnerships worldwide. And starting at the level of Ukraine and Georgia, our report just says, look, you got to get a lot more strategic about it. And, 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 and for U Georgia and Ukraine, the first thing NATO can do, the best thing NATO can do to help those countries is to have a, a better funded, more strategic use of its partnerships. I think that's job number one. Thank you for, for those, those answers. Um, I'd like to close with a, a viewer question that, that is, is maybe closer that for all of us than we would like it to be. As we're seeing an uptick in, in COVID cases here in the US, but also in Germany, uh, one of our viewers was curious whether any of your deliberations touched on the role that NATO could play in dealing with the COVID pandemic or, and or looking to the future what about future public health threats um, like, like the COVID-19 pandemic? Is that something that came up um, in your discussions and were there some concrete suggestions about how NATO could deal with that? Yes, uh, it's, it's part of the report. It, there is a, a section there uh, and the answer is yes, there's a role for NATO uh, to assist where they are, have capabilities for transportation, uh, medical institutions, things like that, uh, number one. Uh, number two is uh, the pandemic should not undermine the, uh, the, the troops in the field. Difficult enough, this is core task for NATO. But, uh, and, and thirdly, NATO should make a lessons learned exercise um, for good reasons. But then uh, NATO is not the first respond responder for uh, for fighting against pandemics. There are other institutions. So we are a second responder. Um, we can help the people. We can help the governments. NATO can help um, uh, hospitals. Uh, but NATO is not uh, the WHO for, uh, for NATO countries. Um, it's not an excuse for national governments to, uh, to find something who should do this. Um, we are not responsible for everything. Yeah, just adding to that, Steve. Um, I, think it, I think there's a challenge for all of us who work on NATO on both sides of the Atlantic and who love NATO, that any problem we see in the world, we want to imagine a NATO tool or instrument to deal with that problem. That's natural, it's inevitable, it's the institution that we think about most and uh, we got a lot of challenges in the world, but going back to what I said at the outset, our group tried to be circumspect and disciplined, disciplined in coming back to kind of what does NATO exist to do? Um, mission creep is as lethal for an organization like NATO, in my view, as it is for a private business, NGO, whatever. And so our... Our, our, our report, it looks at COVID and says, look, we can't ignore this. If we produce a report that said nothing about COVID, people could rightly point out and say, you're tone deaf. You don't understand what's going on in the world. Of course we did, but, but it was a strategic and, and deliberative decision to not um, imagine a role for NATO that goes beyond what it's built to do. And, 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 and I think to the point, as I said earlier, this is a classic example, climate being another, where we, 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 the discipline we showed was in saying, where does, it, where does a pandemic properly intersect with NATO's core business of security? Of course it does. And imagine, for example, th think of COVID as a test run and imagine a circumstance in the not so distant future where there is a pandemic of equal or greater magnitude that comes at a moment when NATO is enmeshed in a great security crisis. How well does our handling of COVID reflect upon our ability to deal with um, a kind of multi-horizon strategic threat environment. Um, so with that in mind, with that intersection of security and, and public health in mind, the report says a couple things on, on pandemics. One, look at lessons learned um, with an emphasis on resilience and, and managing the, the unexpected. There's a lot of takeaways from this in the logistics, communications, all the key metrics of, of resilience, by all means, look at what can be done better at NATO.
Secondly, um, consistent with existing defense priorities, and this goes back to something I'm, I said a minute ago on a different different subject, incorporate this into how you, into your dress rehearsals, how you train, how you exercise, how you plan. I think those are both concrete and realistic things that NATO can do that don't get too far beyond the breakers into the competencies of, of as, as Thomas has said, um, na na nation states, members. Well, Wes Mitchell, Thomas de Mazier, thank you both so much for sharing this updated strategic concept for NATO with us and with our members. Um, at the outset, Thomas, you, you talked about how important it is to get the word out um, about this report, about the work that you've been doing. And if there are any ways that we at the ACG can help um, serve as a Sprachrohr, can sort of get the word out to, to the community here in the US and in Germany, we are very happy to do that. But I want to really thank both of you, particularly since you're both program alumni, for taking the time to share this important work with us today. Thank you very much and uh, all the best for you and the whole team. Thank you. Bye -bye. And of course, thank you to our viewers as well for tuning in and for asking lots of great questions. Thanks for everything, Steve. Appreciate the opportunity. Good to see you both. Take care.